Are you a fan of fasting? Yes, I'm talking about the whole idea of not eating intentionally. Well, fasting is a really popular tool in some circles. And I find that some people in the bone health space also find it to be really popular because of some of the same things like metabolic health, maybe longevity, this concept of autophagy. The question that comes up though with our patients and in our communities is, should we fast if we have osteoporosis? Now, my initial thought on this was no because I don't want people to be in a significant calorie deficit. I don't want people to be uh, deficient of protein. I want to put our patients and our, our listeners and followers into an anabolic state. An anabolic state means a state where we can build muscle and bone. If we're putting them in a catabolic state through calorie restriction, uh, potentially through time-restrictive feeding, which we'll talk about, um, I'm worried that that's going to potentially have a negative impact on their bone. But there is evidence to support doing it. So let's review this literature together and see if the literature can change my mind on whether or not fasting is a smart tool to use for someone that has osteoporosis. So I'm curious, if you're fasting and you're using this as a tool in your own health, I'd love to hear your story. If you could leave us a comment on YouTube, I would love to hear how you're using it and if you're seeing success in both maintaining muscle mass as well as bone quality. So I used to be a big fan of fasting. When I started my practice in the health optimization space, uh, I was really intrigued by the, again, the metabolic benefit. Um, I thought it was a really powerful tool for those that struggle with maintaining their weight loss, which was a big focus early on in our practice. The physiology and the hormonal changes that occur with intentionally restricting food is really fascinating. But I started to back away from fasting when I realized that most of our patients were patients with osteoporosis and sarcopenia. And even in my own life where I found that I was struggling to get the calories and the protein that I needed, as well as other micronutrients to actually hit the goals that I had outside of fasting. So fasting almost kind of got in the way. I've also realized that when you fast, and this is definitely more true for women than for men, but there are periods of time for a premenopausal woman during her natural rhythm that she probably is going to not fast as well, meaning that the stress from fasting can actually provoke adrenal health challenges. It can actually make sleep worse. Um, again, it can have an impact on nutrition, which will have an impact downstream. Uh, Postmenopausal women, I think this is still true. And for men, I think this is also true, but to varying degrees from person to person. I've also noticed that other influencers who are big advocates for fasting out of the gate have kind of backed off a little bit. So you get influencers like Peter Atia, who's really known for longevity, who used to promote you know weekly fasting and then quarterly three-day fasting and now doesn't fast at all. Uh, and so you start to look into the research and start to get a sense like, ooh, maybe we were a little too hot on this. But I still think this is an interesting tool, especially for people that have metabolic dysfunction, and that can coincide with bone health other people that want to use it from a longevity perspective. So, all right, is it actually going to break down our bone? Are we going to do ourselves a disservice if our primary goal is to reverse osteoporosis? Can we actually fast and maintain bone and muscle? And that's what I want to get into. So before we dig into the research, I want to talk a little bit about what fasting is, because there's a lot of different ways to do it. Fasting is a really vague term after all. So really fasting is the same thing as starvation, but it's intentional. So fasting is intentionally depriving yourself of food, but for how long and what do you do when you're eating? And those are the variables that really make a difference when it comes to the literature and the impact on your body. So let's look at it this way. So when you hear people talk about fasting, they'll say, I'm doing a 16-8 or I'm doing a uh, an every other day or an OMAD, which is one meal a day. There's a, a ton of ways to spin it. But basically, you are selecting a time frame in which you're going to restrict yourself from eating. And the most common one is 16-8, meaning you're going to not eat for 16 hours, and then you're going to have a feeding window of eight hours. OMAD is one meal a day, so that's more like 23 hours of not eating and then one hour of eating. Uh, you can do, again, alternate day fasting. There's a lot of ways to do it. But it's going to be the time frame in which you are not eating, the time frame in which you're feeding, and then what happens on the, the other days? So some people, again, alternate day. Um, some people are going to fast one day and not the other. Some people will restrict on one day. And then on the next day, they'll actually consume more food. So then that brings up the question of energy intake. So it is commonly thought that one of the reasons why fasting can be effective for weight loss is because it simply reduces your energy intake. Now, depending on your feeding window, there are some people who do struggle to get all of their nutrients in in that feeding window. So OMAD, for example, one meal a day. If you're consuming one meal a day, it's hard for most people to get their entire day's worth of nutrients in one meal. I would argue even if you could actually consume it, I don't know that you could actually assimilate it and absorb it. 
Um, so there's some challenges there. But OMAD or one meal a day is pretty extreme. Most people, again, are doing more like a 16-8. Now, in eight hours, I can easily consume my day's worth of calories. In fact, in general, I, gen I tend to overshoot it. And in eight hours, I will end up feasting and consuming more food than if I wasn't fasting. And that's not uncommon either. So the caloric amount matters. The energy matters. And we'll see this in the studies because if you're consuming the same calories as you would otherwise, it's possible then that you could benefit from the fasting and still get all the nutrients, assuming you could actually get it in and assimilate it in the amount of time that you have to eat. So the two main components I worry about with fasting for people that have osteoporosis and sarcopenia or loss of muscle mass are bone and muscle health. So can we build muscle and fast? Can we build bone and fast? So there are studies that look at both and some overlap, but let's look at both and let's start with muscle. So this first study I want to talk about is kind of cool because they used, it was a small randomized control trial, but they used what would consider to be a, some people call this an easy fasting uh, modality. They use a 12-12. Now I would argue that not eating for 12 hours is not really a fasting window. I would call that an overnight fast or just not eating from dinner to breakfast, which is what you're supposed to do. But because so many people are eating after dinner and they get up early, some people eat in the middle of the night or whatever. So this first study is uh, kind of a typical study that you would see on fasting. So it's relatively short. It's six weeks. They used a 16-8 window. So not eating for 16 hours and then eating for eight hours. So randomized control trial of 24 individuals. So this is what we typically see. This is why there's quite a bit of weakness in this literature, but you can still pull some stuff out of here. So what they noticed in this study is that even though it was only over six weeks, they did not notice a change in lean mass, which is good. Now, what they did point out here, though, is that this was isocaloric, meaning that they estimated how much, how much they needed from an energy perspective, and they gave the participants that many calories. Therefore, even though they were in a 16-8 feeding window, they were not in a calorie deficit. Therefore, they did not lose weight or muscle mass. So we were looking specifically at muscle mass. There are lots of these studies that look at weight loss, and we're going to kind of gloss over a lot of that. Uh, but there was no change in that study in six weeks. But again, that's only six weeks. So let's look at another study. So if you look at studies that are a little bit longer, so the second study, for example, this is a study on 116 individuals over 12 weeks. Now they're also doing a 16-8 fast. The difference between these two studies, other than it's longer, is that they did not intend for this to be isocaloric, meaning that if they ended up in a calorie deficit, that was okay. And indeed, that's what happened. So in the people that were fasting, 16-8, they did end up in a calorie deficit. So this was, again, a, an RCT. So they did have a placebo group here. And uh, what they noticed is that in the placebo group, there was really no change in weight. There was really no change in any other factors, uh, no change in lean mass. But compared to the starting point, the fasting group actually did lose a little bit of weight, although not very much, but they also did lose lean mass. So here we're saying, okay, well, in a calorie deficit, they actually did lose muscle mass. They lost a little bit of weight too, uh, but it was mostly through muscle mass. So when you get out of an isocaloric environment, then you run the risk of losing muscle mass. And we know that that's true because when you look at weight loss literature, you see very clearly that you're going to lose somewhere between 25 and 50% of your weight loss through muscle mass. That's why you have to lose weight the right way um, if you want to keep it off. But uh, this is true here. So if you go even in 12 weeks, if you're cutting calories, you're going to end up losing some muscle mass. And this is one of my fears. So, so this reinforces that fear around calorie restriction from time-restricted feeding. So then the next question is, what if we added resistance training? Because we know that in caloric restriction, even in fasting, if you add resistance training, you can mitigate some of those losses of uh, lean, lean mass uh, or muscle mass. So this is a study, 2019 randomized control trial that was isocaloric. So they ate the same number of calories. Uh, they did time-restricted feeding in one group and um, regular meals in the other group. It was for eight weeks, and it was specifically in women, only 40 women, so not a huge study, but still reasonable-sized group. The time-restricted feeding group and the control group also all gained fat-free mass or lean mass. So this study with the resistance training showed that this group was able to pick up some lean mass or some muscle mass uh, as a result of doing this resistance training, which is cool. So now we have a study where we're saying, all right, it's time-restricted feeding. They are 
isocaloric and they're doing resistance training and they actually gained muscle mass despite the fact that they were time restricted feeding. So again, we can pull multiple levers and we could still potentially get the benefits of fasting and not lose muscle mass. Now, of course, they didn't measure bone health. It'd be hard to do in eight weeks, uh, but it just goes to show that you can, with resistance training, mitigate some of those potential losses. Before we get into the bone health research, let me just mention this. If you're struggling to put together your own bone health program, consider joining our free masterclass. Our masterclass is where we go through how we develop a customized bone health program. We leave about 15 minutes for questions at the end, and thousands of people have gone through this and found it to be really helpful. If you haven't done that yet, I would encourage you to do so. It's totally free. Look for the link in the description on YouTube, or if you're listening to this on a podcast, go to optimalhumanhealth.com, and you can find a link for the masterclass there. All right, so the studies we've been waiting for. What do the studies show with bone health in time-restrictive feeding or fasting? All right, so this next study is a randomized control trial from 2023 looking at a six-month intervention in 42 individuals. So that's pretty long, actually. So I'd love to see more people than 42, but we'll take it. So we've got a six-month intervention, and they're looking specifically at time-restrictive feeding, a 16-8 window, versus what they call standard dietary advice. I can only imagine what that is. So then we compare what happens over the next six months. So they looked at bone mineral density, again, at the six-month mark, and what they found is in those that lost weight from time-restricted feeding, which there was a subgroup that did, for those that lost weight, they did not lose bone density. For those that didn't lose weight, there was no difference between the um, standard dietary advice group and the time-restricted feeding group. So if they didn't lose weight, there was no benefit, but if there was weight loss from fasting, then there was actually a bone-sparing effect in the time-restricted feeding group, which is pretty cool. So we did find a bunch of shorter studies, uh, you know, six-week, eight-week, 12-week, that were looking at bone mineral density. But the challenge here is that bone turnover markers might change in that time frame, or likely would change in that time frame, but bone density is not gonna change significantly. I don't really care what you're doing uh, unless you're doing something really dramatic. So from a dietary perspective, we're not gonna see benefit. And so there's a meta-analysis here that we pulled that just showed simply that in 16-8 or 12-12 fasting regimens over these short term that there was really no change in bone mineral density, which is exactly what we would expect. I guess it's good to show it though, because oftentimes people will go on fasting regimens that are intentionally short, you know, six weeks of alternate day or six weeks of 16-8 to do, do whatever, autophagy or weight loss. So it doesn't look like you're gonna have a negative impact on bone mineral density in those short term fasting regimens, which is good to know. Now we've talked about 16-8 and 12-12, but what about alternate day fasting? So this is a really popular form of fasting. And when people say alternate day fasting, you might also hear this referred to as fasting mimicking diet. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to say this, but basically the whole goal here is to reduce calories on one day and then potentially overeat them on the next day. And so you have a fasting day and a feasting day. And the idea is you're kind of like push pull, you're creating some momentum. It's relatively popular. So an alternate day fasting regimen in this study was shown to not only provoke a little bit of weight loss in those that performed it, but have no change whatsoever in bone mineral density. Now, let's look closely though at what they did, because I think this matters. So in the fasting day, there was a 25% intake. So they calculated their calorie needs, they gave them 25% of calorie needs. So that's pretty darn calorie restricted. And then on the alternate day, they gave them 125%. So pushed them into an anabolic phase. And so you were going back and forth, catabolic, anabolic, on a daily basis. And after six months of that, there was no loss in bone mineral density and no change in bone turnover markers. So I think that's kind of cool. This is true even in people that lost weight. So unlike the study we showed previously, uh, even if you lost weight where they lost muscle mass in that study, in this study, there was no loss of bone mass in six months for those that lost weight with alternate day fasting. So we pulled a number of other studies and I won't dig into them. I'll just give you the summary, which is this. Even in older populations, even in female populations, if you do fasting, especially in an isocaloric environment with resistance training, you don't see loss of bone mineral density and you can preserve muscle mass even if you lose weight. So if we're going to fast, we have to do it right. But I will tell you that this research really changed my perspective on fasting. If a patient wants to fast for me now for a metabolic health challenge, let's say they have an elevated A1C insulin, uh, and fasting glucose, then I think we could comfortably say, yeah, you can fast and you're probably not going to have a negative impact on your bone health. But I need you to do resistance training, which my patients are doing anyway. I need you to get adequate protein, which my patients are doing anyway. And then we just need to be smart about how hard we're pulling that lever. So is a 16-8 every day adequate for their goals? And if so, they're probably fine, right? 
if they wanted to do 24 hour fasts every day, that's probably not going to work real well. Like OMAD, I think probably too aggressive. Um, if they want to do a three day fast, we didn't see any studies on that, right? Um, I would imagine you could probably do three days and then alternate with some feasting and you would probably be fine, but we don't have any evidence to support that. So I think it just depends on how hard you want to push. But I think we definitely could use this lever in somebody that has osteoporosis and expect that we're still going to see improvements in bone health. So this changed my mind. So if you found this helpful, you might want a little bit more on diet for osteoporosis. And this is my 2024 update for the best diet for osteoporosis in a broad perspective. And then we also have one on the best exercise for osteoporosis. So those are the two main pillars that we're encouraging everybody to uh, consider what they're capable of uh, if their goal is to improve bone health and reverse osteoporosis. So remember that osteoporosis isn't the end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.